I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the Naval Institute. Uh, and it's my honor, my, my pleasure, to introduce today's panel conversation, which is titled China-Taiwan. We don't have a decade. What must we do now to prepare? And today's panel is, is the American Sea Power Project articles in the December proceedings brought from the page to the stage. We started the American Sea Power Project three years ago. Our view at that time, as Ron just, I think, so well uh, elucidated, was that the end of the Cold War had brought an end uh, to the urgent need for in-depth thinking about maritime strategy. And during the next three decades, naval planning and force structure were guided more by budgets, technology, and land operations than by any meaningful maritime strategy or by design. With the return of great power competition, however, there was a need to get back to strategic thinking about what it means for the United States to be a maritime nation and how naval power underpins national power. Using an ends, ways, means structure, we started with foundational high-level articles in 2021, including Nick Lambert's What is a Navy For? In 2022, we moved into the ways in which naval power can be applied. And this month, in December, we kicked off the phase three of the project with the War of 2026 scenario, which is a realistic and challenging China-Taiwan scenario, followed by five warfare domain articles. We asked these authors to look at the scenario and consider how they could tackle this problem with the Navy and Marine Corps capabilities and force structure anticipated in 2026, which is essentially today's force structure. We asked them to provide an assessment of strengths and weaknesses and provide their best advice for what DOD, Congress, and the White House could do right now to shore up any weaknesses. More articles are coming in the January issue, and we may have a couple more coming in February, so this is just the start of the conversation. I'd like to quickly introduce the panelists and then ask each of them to talk briefly about their articles. My first guest is retired Navy Admiral Sandy Winnefeld, former Vice Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Admiral Winnefeld was an F-14 pilot and a Top Gun instructor. He later commanded a fighter squadron, the aircraft carrier USS Enterprise, the Theodore Roosevelt Carrier Strike Group, US Sixth Fleet, and US Northern Command. He is a longtime proceedings author, winner of several of our essay contests, including, and this is why we asked him to write on this topic, including our 2018 Mine Warfare Essay Contest. His article is titled, Mine Warfare Could Be Key. Commander Paul Giara is a P-3 pilot, in the, was a P-3 pilot in the Navy, a graduate of the Japan Self-Defense College, and a manager in OSD of the U.S. Japan Alliance. He's also one of the original instigators of the American Sea Power Project, and he co-authored the War of 2026 scenario, and he worked with several other authors on their articles. Uh, unfortunately, Commander Scott Tate and Commander Anthony Lavopa, uh, who are the authors of It's All About Sea Control, could not be here today, and so Paul is going to talk about the scenario and about their article. Uh, the author of the Undersea Warfare article, You Can't Win Without More Submarines, is retired Navy Captain Bill Toady. Bill commanded the USS Indianapolis and Submarine Squadron 3 in the Pacific during his Navy career, and he has held senior positions at several companies uh, in the defense industry. And finally, Commander Graham Scarborough is an F-18 Super Hornet Weapons Systems Officer, the 2019 Proceedings Author of the Year, and now a PhD candidate at Johns Hopkins. His article is titled, Strike Warfare's Inventory Problem. So I'll start with Avril Winnefeld. Sir, mine warfare could be key, but will it be? Well, in, this, in the article that I wrote uh, at the pause point in the scenario, it was a bit late uh, <clears throat> for that. Not too late, but uh, a bit late. And uh, as I approached uh, the challenge that you gave me, and by the way, mine warfare is not a domain. It's a warfare area, right? <clears throat> but that's okay. I ignored that. Uh, I, I approached it from first principles, and that is, you know, how do we get here in the first place? It's not going well in the scenario. And I, I, I lean, hearken back to, you know, the fact that in Asia, 
It's all about conditions to be managed, not problems to be solved. And so it's very important that we continue to manage the conditions as we're managing them so we don't have this conflict in the first place. And we can see from your scenario why we don't want to have this conflict. But the enemy has a vote. Uh, and there may be enough of these event and condition-based things that line up to where we could find ourselves in, this, in the scenario that, that you outlined. And, you know, some people will attack the scenario. I've already heard people attacking the scenario, but, you know, who cares? It's like, get over it. It's, the important thing is what, what comes out of, out of the discussion. And it, it seemed to me that, you know, while we were uh, spending 20 years on uh, trying to convert two foreign nations into Jeffersonian democracies, China did not take their eye off the ball, and we all know that. They've come a long way, an amazing uh, distance, in, very, uh, in a focused way, finding ways to keep us out of the Indo-Pacific region, and in particular their backyard. That's not going well for us, okay? Um, that's sort of point one. Point two is that our response has, has been sort of typical U.S. military. Let, you know, let's, you know, more means, you know, not necessarily different ways, and let's buy more ships, buy more stuff, more and better stuff. But that's not going very well either. Uh, we, we are uh, really sort of, I think, falling behind in that competition. And to the point where we're starting to change our assumptions about that conflict to match our preferred way of fighting this war. And that's the, the first sign of failure of a business is if you change your assumptions to the circumstances rather than challenge your assumptions. And, and the definition of assumption being if it's wrong, you have to change your plan. So, uh, and then the third thing is, it may be alluded to in your last panel, is the budgets are not going to be there. If, if anybody who thinks that we can man, train, equip, and build 355 ships can't look at the fact that we, we can't even do it with what we have in terms of budgets. So, so we are in this place where, while we have the chance to continue what we're doing to deter China, and that's successful at the moment, it's going to go away, we should be using this time to think of another way, a new concept. And that new concept cannot just be a military thinking of another military as a center of gravity. It has to be a government thinking of another government's leadership as the center of gravity. And when you start thinking in that way, you start thinking of, of different uh, ways of doing business, and you end up with a slightly different looking military. And, and that's a long way of saying part of that slightly different military is shutting down commerce. It's shutting down the enemy's ability to, to move across the sea, but to do it in a way that is not as costly as the current way that we're talking, not, not only financially, but in blood uh, uh, in that fight. And mine warfare has a key role to play in, in either way you approach this. It, it has a key role to play if you think of the Chinese military as the center of gravity, but it also has a key role to play if you think of the Chinese leadership as the center of gravity by shutting down uh, all of their ports fairly quickly, which, which in legal terms, uh, you know, you, you can do that to counter a military, but also legal terms understand that uh, commerce can be a collateral damage associated with that. So mine warfare is, is going to be very important, I think, in a future conflict, especially if we can do it quickly after the start of the, of the fight. Uh, and frankly, we're just not there. Uh, we, we are uh, terribly short in numbers and technology of those systems. There are, there are some actions we can take very quickly to at least partially rectify that. There are some technical actions we can take in the midterm that would make it even better. Uh, but unless we focus on that, uh, we're not going to be where we need to be. And I'll close out by the reason why we're not focused on that is partly because if you look at the spectrum of flag officers across the Navy, you have submariners, you have aviators, and you have surface warfare officers, and a few other cats and dogs thrown in there. There is no mine warfare officer that I can think of that is a flag officer in the U.S. Navy. So there's no champion. Uh, you know, am I going to buy another DDG or am I going to actually have a robust mining capability? And then when you consider that we sort of lump mine warfare with countermine warfare, it would be the same thing as I say at the end of the article of saying, you know, uh, offensive missile and defensive missile warfare, they're the same thing because they both have the word missile in them. Well, mine warfare and countermine warfare are, are dramatically different from each other. And we need to have that community of offensive mine warfare because it, we have been a victim of that in the past. And we also used it to help us beat Japan in World War II. And we just don't have it right now. So there are some tremendous capabilities there that we could have that could be really decisive in this conflict. Thank you, sir. Uh, Paul Giara, I'll ask you to briefly overview the scenario and give us some highlights from uh, Scott Tate and Anthony Levopa's article on sea control. 
told me I had three to five minutes to talk on both of those subjects, and my problem was how to talk slowly so I could tell you everything I know. Um, it's hard to, for, I didn't know I was going to be here until late last night, so uh, uh, you'll have to bear with me. It's, it's hard for me in my mind to differentiate and to pull apart the project, the ASPP, the scenario, and all of these articles. So I'm going to try to do that. Um, the premise of the project, at least in my mind, I can only speak for myself, was that the bottom had fallen out of American public, congressional, and Navy sort of appreciation for what naval power was all about in the American context. And uh, we thought we had to redress that. And that's, that's why we went into the ends, ways, means construct. We left means, what we're now in, to the end, because that's what everybody always wants to talk about, to the exclusion of everything else. So now we're in the, in the uh, means process. As far as the scenario goes, I hope you think of me as your strategic dentist. I want to make you uncomfortable because it's an uncomfortable time. It's the return to great power competition. Great power competition is geopolitics 101. Sea power is the greatest single determinant of geopolitics. With a global ready navy, we might prevail. Without that navy, we won't. And so that's the premise of the scenario. It's obviously a scenario, scenario in which it's 2026. That number was chosen. It's a two year from now, a little bit more than two years from now. Is there a Davidson window or isn't there? So that's the premise of the scenario. And we are not, the, it should be obvious from the scenario, whether you agree with this or not, that we think that we are not ready, that we cannot compete with China. And that's the, the approach that um, at least most of the authors have taken. Uh, this presents numbers of different challenges. Do you, do you get rid of some existing capabilities and try to get new ones? Do you do both of those things at the same time? Uh, there's all kinds of moving parts to this. What we are hoping that both the project and the scenario and now these articles are going to do is to inspire you to think deeply, much more deeply than we can address on this panel, certainly, and more deeply than even the project can get at, to think about and from your perspectives add your weight to this effort because nobody remember, very few on active duty remember what great power competition was like. So in the surface domain, I, I could kiss the authors. Uh, I, I know both of them pretty well. They are both of, of like mind with me because they were on a starship. Both, they're both Zumwalt sailors. Scott Tate commanded and Anthony Lavopa was part of the crew and then went on to the Zumwalt uh, requirements desk. They understand getting ahead of the problem, and they understand from the perspective of their article how behind the problem the uh, surface fleet is. Spread way too thin, dependent upon other domains and communities who themselves are spread thin, and this is presenting virtually insurmountable uh, obstacles. They stipulate, and this is really important, uh, I am a... I was an aviator, but I had two shipboard tours. I was an aviator because I like ships. I asked to fly P3s because I wanted to defend ships from Soviet submarines. My point here is that this is about sea control and what surface ships can do in that regard. That's certainly what the article's about, but I think the bigger picture is about that too. Um, one of the key uh, points they're trying to make for us is innovate early. If Trent Hone, Scott Mobley, Mark Wilson, uh, and others have meant anything in their writings, it's that getting ready has to start way before today's date of December 7th. 
You think back December 7th, 1941, we had been getting ready since the middle of the 1930s. Um, so this is truly important. Uh, this business of being spread thin, what are the results of that? In this scenario, which we think is realistic and which I've heard from several different unexpected quarters in the last two days, yeah, that's what we're thinking too. Um, it's that we lost sea control in the Western Pacific. And whether and how to get it back then is what the rest of the, of the uh, article talks about. Um, finally, since my time is up, I will just close. I, I recommend you read the article if you hadn't. They've done a really nice job of capturing this. Um, but if uh, they make a point that doing more with less is one approach to budgeting. But it's no approach, no way to approach global war with a peer competitor. All right, thanks, Paul. Uh, before I move on to uh, Bill Toady to talk about submarines, I just want to mention that uh, the fifth article, uh, and the author could not be here because he's in Okinawa, Lieutenant Colonel Brian Kirk is the author of the, uh, the article that tackled the amphibious and Marine Corps capabilities in this scenario. And it is titled, Put Three MEF in a Fighting Stance. And I would recommend that one to you. Uh, so Bill, let's turn to submarines. And your article, you specifically you know, foot stomp more submarines. Uh, why specifically, and, and how many more? Thanks, Bill. First of all, I want to say that I'm honored to be here. Um, there are a whole lot of luminaries you could have asked, and you asked me, and I'm very proud of that. A few years ago, in one of my industry jobs, I was in Taiwan speaking to their chairman and their director of their National Security Council. And, and she asked me, um, what do you think, why do you think you know something about Taiwan? And you know, I kind of failed open for a moment. I said, well, I did do seven submarine deployments into the region over the course of my career. And I've been studying the problem for 30 years. And she said, but this is the first time you've been here, right? Yeah. Well, you treat us like this is Mars. You study it from a distance. And you opine on how we're supposed to win this war. Maybe we have an opinion on that. And then for the next hour and a half or so, she uh, started giving me that opinion, right? And it was a good opinion. And there was some perspectives in there that I had not thought of. But fundamentally, when you come, came down to it, it was really about stopping the invasion. And what, do we, what are we doing as the United States to assist them in that, in the, in the denied environment that we're going to operate in? And as a submarine, I already knew, there was going to be a requirement for all naval forces. It's going to be a full court press. We're going to have to keep the pressure on everything. But the only thing that really will be able to get into the strait in a denied environment with medium risk are our SSNs. And so that has two implications. Number one, numbers count more than technology. And anti-surface counts more than anti-submarine. And I say that as an ASW guy, so it breaks my heart, right? And so those two implications, let's talk about the numbers. We'll talk about construction first, because I resonated with Ron's statement that there is a feeling of hopelessness when people start talking about new construction, because we can't, just, we can't do it with the two shipyards we have. That's the sense that emerges from this false narrative. The problem is Ronald Reagan did it with these two shipyards we had. So what happened? In fact, he increased the number of submarines by 12 during his eight years in presidency. So what happened between then and now? The president made it a priority. National leaders made it a priority. We had a support of Congress who provided the money. We didn't decommission the old submarines while we were building the new ones. We had a, a different regulatory environment and a an DOD staff that knew how to support and maintain an industrial base. And we had a culture in the United States of working on manufacturing. We lost that last one through a combination of national economic policy and, frankly, defense acquisition, malfeasance. So there are things we can do. 
I don't have time to talk about them now, to improve the production. The other problem is maintenance. Too many of our submarines are in maintenance today, and we have the wrong outlook. In World War II, when we were facing the Battle of Midway, we had Yorktown with battle damage, and Nimitz gave Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard 72 hours to get Yorktown underway. We need a Yorktown plan for our submarines today. We need a firm deadline. If you don't have a hull cut one month and you're at sea, you do have a hull cut two months and you're at sea because we can't do it without them. We don't have enough. And weapons. We were the sleeping giant in World War II because we could kick our production into high gear after the war started. We actually started our Navy buildup before the war started. And the only country that's doing that now is China. Today, we can't do that. We can't lie to ourselves and think we're going to turn on production of munitions once the war begins. This is going to be a fight with what you got war. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that I can get into, but we don't have time. That means that it's going to be unlike World War II, where Japan wanted a quick victory and then negotiate for peace. China's want to, going to want this to stretch out because we're going to run out of munitions. That's their, going to be their plan for victory. And the last thing on UUVs, the only thing I'll say is UAVs are useful. They provide combat capability. But with today's technologies, UUVs ought to be called useless undersea vehicles except for maybe Orca, because in this theater, in this war, they offer almost nothing. What they do is provide an excuse to not fund the things that work. Is that enough, Bill? That'll get us started. Thanks, Ron. Uh, Graham, we, we all saw Top Gun Maverick a year and a half ago. Uh, Maverick famously said a lot of things, but he said, it's about the man or the woman in the box, the individual aircrew flying the airplane. Your article essentially says, yes, but. Uh, so do we have enough men and women in enough airplanes with the right and enough weapons? Thank, thanks, Bill. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having me here. Uh, I know this is the Naval Institute, and this usually goes without saying, but I just want to make it clear that I'm here representing myself, and I don't represent the US Navy, Johns Hopkins University, uh, what my parents might think of me. Um, all of these opinions are my own, uh, so please uh, forward any complaints to me. Um, to, to sort of build on the, on the last point, um, the, the scenario is built around 2026 as this, um, the date for the, the war. Um, and so we, we are in an era of great power competition. We're all familiar with that buzzword, but what we're facing with this scenario is great power war, and that is um, the destruction of people and equipment in combat um, with, with national implications. And in that scenario and in that timeline, we have to hold what we got. What we have is what we've got. And no technological savior is going to present itself between now and January 1st, 2026, or if you're generous with the scenario, December 31st, 2026. There is a long list of historical instances of countries that depended on exquisite technology and highly trained, um, hard to replace people um, to fight and win their wars. And um, I, I would wager that the combat record of those uh, uh, militaries is probably pretty poor because um, uh, as the general said our opening this morning, quantity has a quality all its own. And so when I'm looking at um, the 2026 scenario for this article, I had to focus on what can be done between now and then, and there's three places that I, I chose to make that stand. One is in uh, aircraft uh, as a strike platform. Um, the strike missions that will be executed in this scenario will not be like the strike missions of my career where I could take a leisurely stroll into Afghanistan at 350 knots and hang out for six and a half hours and then come back uh, for sliders and a night trap uh, on the boat. Um, this is going to be strike warfare under fire with combat losses. Those losses need to be replaced and um, with 500 Super Hornets as our strike fighter in in uh, inventory. Uh, as, that have to conduct both strike uh, and fighting air-to-air uh, -air missions and aerial refueling and training back at home and testing new systems, we're going to need more airplanes to replace those combat losses. Um, 
When those airplanes go down, we don't like to think about it, but it takes one or two, it may take one or two people with it. Um, we need a deep bench. The, the Imperial Japanese Navy did not have that bench. They did not prioritize training sufficiently their replacement air crew, and they suffered for it. And Japanese naval aviation suffered for it and drove, that helped drive them to kamikaze tactics in the later part of the war. And I don't think that that's something that the American people are gonna stand for, and I certainly wouldn't. And so what we need is we need to focus on training capable naval aviators as a deep bench today. I cite some retention statistics in my article that should get everybody's heart racing, where 60% of strike fighter aviators up for department head turned down department head. Those are senior O3s, junior O4s, the exact type of people who will be your squadron commanders um, and, um, and wing staffers uh, in a fight. We don't need all of them to make department head, but we'd like to have them around. One of the questions I get the most from my civilian colleagues at Johns Hopkins is, if there was a war, would they call you out of getting your PhD to go fly fighter planes? And my answer is, well, at first was, nah, I don't think so. But now I think, well, no, they wouldn't put me back in a fighter plane. I'm more a danger um, to anybody at this point after a year and a half out of the cockpit. But what they would do is they'd put me on a staff so they could grab some other combat aviator and put them in the airplane. But what do they do when they run out of PhD students um, to, to go write, uh, write plans and draft PowerPoints at Pack Fleet? Um, and we need to think about that now. And we have a real training crisis in naval aviation that needs to be addressed. And then the last piece is armaments. Again, one of the things that we can do, we can't wait for the you know, AGM 6000 that flies at Mach 1 trillion and goes into outer space and is targeted via rainbows. We can't wait for that for 2026. We have weapons in the inventory now we need to build more of them. The uh, 155 millimeter shells uh, in Ukraine um, went through a, are going through a 600% increase in construction from the start of the war to now. Um, manufacturers in the United States want to build a million shells a month. Now, I don't say we need a million cruise missiles a month, but imagine a 600% increase in cruise missiles, land attack cruise missiles, Tomahawks, uh, Slam ER, um, and the uh, Air Force's um, uh, anti-surface missile, joint anti-surface missile. Imagine a 600% increase in production in wartime. Um, that, that increase needs to start happening now um, so that we can give people that are fighting to get to the fight, if you remember that buzzword, we are giving those people a chance to put fires ashore in, in, uh, in support of the ground campaign and the defense of Taiwan. I'm gonna uh, start with a couple of questions for the panel and I'd ask folks in the audience to come forward to the uh, uh, microphones to ask questions. And when you do ask a question, please state your name and ask a question, uh, keep, keep it short, don't make it a long remark, just, just get to the question. Uh, so I'll start. Uh, one of the things that we asked you all to do and the other authors in this project was to describe at the end of your articles what levers could Congress and the DOD pull now that would have the greatest impact in this scenario time frame. This is the next couple of years. So what are some things, I'll start with Admiral Winnefeld, uh, what are some things that we could do right now uh, in, in I, I wouldn't even put any political parameters on it, but what, what could be done now to get us in a better position to fight this scenario in 2026? Yeah, first I would say that um, Congress could, could lend a hand in helping us face reality here. Uh, all of the things that my, the very good points that my fellow panelists made cost money, uh, that is probably not there. Uh, it, it takes industrial base that is probably not there. And it's gonna take a long time to develop that if we choose to, to go down that route, which we probably should. So facing the reality of, of what this conflict, if it happens in the near term, could be like, could put a little more pressure on, and, and, and by the way, Congress usually is not briefed on operational plans for good reason, that, you know, because they'll leak them. Uh, but there may be a few select members that probably ought to be briefed on those so that they themselves can challenge our assumptions and, and see for themselves that this is uh, such a difficult problem rather than just sort of yelling at the top of their lungs if they're, let's say, somebody from Virginia or uh, someplace that makes ships, like, hey, we gotta have more ships, right? Uh, maybe see the reality uh, of the situation and then uh, allowing, giving the military both the um, imperative and the license to reshape itself uh, for may maybe a different uh, idea for how you deter a nation like China. 
And, and the, way, the way you deter China is, is understanding what their leadership wakes up in the morning and fears the most. And they don't fear the United States military the most. They do fear it. That's one reason that's contributing to deterrence. But what they really feel, fear is their own people. And you have to, you, and we don't live that every day. When you have a regime change in the United States, it's called an election, and the losers go off and work in think tanks. Uh, when you have regime change in China, something completely different happens, and they're deathly afraid of that, and you can see that every day in their behavior. So that's what you want to target, and one of the ways you target is economically. Uh, so, um, you know, and, and you want to do it in a way uh, that, that takes, takes into account the fact that no president is going, you know, the, the number one job of any president at the end of that White House sit-room table is to prevent the United States from getting nuked. That's like job number one, and everything else flows, flows from that. And, and you saw what happened with Ukraine, where we provided uh, tangible military support to Ukraine, but not direct military support to Ukraine, because the president doesn't want to get us involved in a nuclear game with Russia. The same thing will happen with, with China. So you've got to start asking assumptions, uh, challenging the assumptions there. And I think that's where the mind warfare piece comes in. Uh, you know, plenty of jobs for the rest of the Navy what I, outside what I would call the hot zone, shutting down Chinese commerce for one thing, which they're deathly afraid of, and we can do a really fine job of that, rather than maybe exposing some of our assets inside that hot zone. And then mine warfare, uh, again, as I mentioned in the article, is a real contributor to that. But you've got to do a few things. You can't, you know, our principal mine right now is the quick strike, which is nothing more than a 500 or 1,000 pound bomb with a JDAM kit on it, so it can be delivered very precisely. And if you're lucky, it has an ER kit on it, which is wings, which means it can be delivered from about 30, 35 miles away from 35,000 feet. I only know a couple of airplanes in our inventory that can survive inside of 30, 40 miles from the Chinese coastline to deliver a mine. So you need to put some power on that weapon. And if you could, if you could have a, a large number of these weapons, you know, built fairly, you know, you're not, there's not a lot of expenditure here because the bombs are already built. Uh, with some sort of uh, propulsion on them, whether it's a rocket motor or whether it's a, a turbofan or something, a little little engine, that would allow you to deliver these things from a distance at scale. I mean, you could shut down every single Chinese port overnight, almost overnight, if you did that. That's powerful. That will strike fear into their heart. It'll make a decisive difference on a battlefield. Rather than banging the pots and pans and going in there against DF-21s and all the other fun uh, things that they've got arrayed against us. So I think Congress can help with that by, again, uh, forcing us to face reality and then giving the military the license to, uh, to, to reset itself. Any other panelists want to uh, take that question? Things that we could build, go ahead. So what we find with the production problem, the shipbuilding problem, really is it isn't so much a tier one problem as it is a tier two and three supplier problems. What that means is, you know, the shipyards themselves can scale up. The problem is all of those component pump suppliers, other manufacturers below them went out of business. We operate in a monopsony. In a monopsony, you either buy stuff or you pay to keep the ability to buy stuff. We didn't do that. I'll give you a specific example. One of my businesses, we built something that was consumed in real time, and we were building barely at a rate that the Navy was consuming it on a day-to-day -day basis in peacetime. So I went to the customer and says, well, what are we gonna do if we go to war? Well, we're gonna ask you to double the consumption rate. I don't have qualified suppliers to double the consumption rate. Okay, so I can get them. It's gonna cost money. Uh, where are we gonna get that money from? You bought, you buy, you're buying this stuff in a low-price shootout. I don't have the money to do that. So you're going to need to fund that. We don't want to fund that. Then we're not, not going to be able to increase consumption rate. That's just the way it is. Second point. So I try to bring in companies like what Ron was talking about, Korean manufacturers, to say, build a factory here and help us with these supplier problems, because we're having trouble finding American companies to do it. They don't want to do it because of the unstable political environment. They're worried that they won't be allowed to do it under Korean ownership. And so we, there's a lot of ways we can solve this problem, but we have to be willing to look outside the box. The third issue is we've got to stop forcing invention. And these are all three things that Congress can help with. We've got a quarterback who can throw the ball 40 yards, but we, get a, we, we require him to throw the ball 80 yards. 
and it take us, takes us 10 years to figure out he ain't never going to throw the ball 80 yards. These kinds of delays, delaying Columbia class, delaying a lot of our surface ship programs are unnecessary. And we've got to figure out, we've actually we've got to take action to keep from doing that in the future. Great points. Uh, Paul? There's a, a slightly different way to look at the scenario that helps to frame the answers to the questions that Bill asked. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you can't change the beginning. You can't go back and change the beginning. But you can, starting today, you can change the end. And the, uh, the, uh, so the, the scenario is asking two things, because it's not just a scenario, but it's prescriptions to authors. And that is, um, where are you now and what can you do, not just in the short term, but in the long term? So there are some short term things that, uh, that Scott and Anthony have addressed, and I'll get to that in just a second, but there are also some longer things. So um, one thing that, that they suggested was an innovation cell at, at the Surface Warfare Command in San Diego. Um, this would bring in leadership from the Naval War College with the Naval Postgraduate School, FFRDCs, UARCs in industry, uh, and get at thinking this through. Now, they framed it in the context of the war had started and they were going to do this. But the beauty of that suggestion is that's starting now to change the ending. And so that has more general uh, utility thinking through some of these challenges. The second is that if we're not ready, where can we go besides our own industry base, which is not ready now, but I personally believe can be gotten ready, but that's another issue. And that is to, number one, go to civilian platforms uh, with uh, VLS cells on the decks, as well as our own amphibious forces and so on. In other words, ways to spread out firepower throughout the fleet in ways that we don't do now. Um, I, I think that those are examples. The third is what has just been mentioned, and that is our allies. Uh, during the Cold War, we made a big deal of interoperability and using the same kinds of munitions so that we could share stocks. This is very much a topic now of uh, ship maintenance and repair in Japan, Korea, the Philippines, and elsewhere, as an example. That's just an example. Uh, so also drawing from them stocks and, and depending upon them, both for combat operations, but also for logistics uh, support to, the, in, in this case of, of the article I'm addressing, the surface force, but it goes well beyond that. Great points. Um, I'm going to go to audience Q&A uh, over here. Uh, oh, uh, we'll, we'll go to the midshipmen then. From the Naval Academy. Um, so we, this window is rapidly closing in a way that we've been talking about is before our domestic uh, shipbuilding capability could theoretically catch up to replace the tonnage that we would lose. Um, and we're already investing in, uh, for example, Australian uh, nuclear uh, boat building capability with the SSN AUKUS program. Do you foresee a situation where we would need to get rid of the Hatch Act to purchase forward-built ships for the U.S. Navy if our domestic production doesn't catch up in time? Foreign-built, no. Foreign design, we're already doing it, right? Frigates and Italian design. Let's, let's face it. Um, I spent some time with German submarine builders to find out if there's any there there for us. And I, I, and I don't believe that that's a solution. Um, I, I, I believe we got to fix ourselves, you know, the old Pogo joke, we've met the enemy and they are us. And so we, we've got to fix that issue. Paul? Uh, there's another aspect to this as well. Um, I believe in long range, heavy American submarines, heavily armed, very, very capable. Uh, to get there, is, that's necessary. To operate there, it's not. Now, for those of you who are having a heart attack and thinking that I'm suggesting that we have diesel-electric submarines in the U.S. inventory, I'm not. What I'm suggesting is that 
our good allies who are living in the first island chain have good diesel electric submarines, very good diesel electric submarines, and the naval culture to operate them. So why should Japan, for instance, only have 22 diesel electric submarines? Why shouldn't they have 44 or 66? Why not flood the zone with, um, with Japanese and South Korean submarines, as an example? So there are other ways to get at the question you're, you're asking, and I suggest that's one of them. Uh, really great question, and I really appreciate you being here, and I appreciate your curiosity. It takes me back to being a fourth-class midshipman myself, and I love it. Uh, congratulations. Um, there are some uh, foreign nations that build some pretty cool ships. I had a, a, a Spanish uh, Aegis frigate in my strike group uh, in the Mediterranean. Very, very capable uh, ship. Um, but I think, in my personal opinion, you know, paying the Spanish to build more ships for us uh, is not the answer. Uh, throwing more uh, f ships into this problem on the surface who are going to have to f largely fill their magazines with self-defense weapons rather than weapons that are going to make a difference in the fight, is, is not, that's not where I would spend an incremental dollar. I would spend my incremental dollars on things, whether they be mines or, frankly, other things, that will operate inside the hot zone at much lower cost and risk to ourselves and operate outside the hot zone in a way that advances our national interests, namely shutting down Chinese commerce and the like. That's where I would spend an incremental dollar. Uh, but it's a really good question. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, good morning, Lieutenant Commander Marcus Garcia. I'm a reserve officer, recently returned from uh, an ADOS tour in Poland. I'm not a USNI member, but I do read my five free articles a month and listen to all the podcasts. <laughs> you should become a member. <laughs> I was at the War College. Um, I just haven't re-signed It's not that up. expensive. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy you a subscription. I, I will do, sir. Um, I can't tell if, if my question was more appropriate for the vice comment out this morning. Our legislators here later, but I'm going to jump in now. Uh, perhaps one little tidbit about the, the most salient aspect of me that is, is relevant to my question here is I'm the father of a four-year-old in Spotsylvania County, Virginia. For those of you that aren't familiar, the school board there recently made a, a lot of re, uh, head, headline news for crazy antics. I'll get to my question. Short of sending the midshipmen and reserve folks like me out into the public, the American public, what more can the Navy, the Joint Force, its senior leaders do to convince the American public of all the good ideas that you gentlemen and the Vice Commandant threw out? Central to all your discussions is change, technological change, climate change, demographic change. I don't, more planes, more submarines, more mines, more countermines more commercial shipping, I, what more can, should we be doing as a joint force? I, I'm at a loss. I, I go down to the school board meetings in Spotsylvania County. These people don't want, they don't want to acknowledge change, let alone pay for the, the aspects that we need to, to manage change and to implement it smartly. So, thank you. I'll, I'll take on that question a little bit here. Uh, I, I don't know that the answer is to send people out to try to convince um, somebody who's you know, in the heartland uh, that we need to buy another DDG or another submarine or, or a mine or whatever. They're, they're going to go, you know, what do you mean by that? I've got my own problems here. I think that the, you have to go back to the first principles of the problem, and that is uh, convincing the American people at a higher level that it matters that we have American leadership in the world. It matters that we have more allies than we've ever had, than any other nation's ever had. It matters that we have est we established a rules-based international order uh, in this current long-wave geopolitical cycle after World War II, and that it's kept us prosperous and safe for a long time, and that participating in the world matters. That's the fundamental thing we need to do. And then, as a, as a subsidiary of that, it's like, and it really is nice if you have a good Navy uh, in, to, to be in that problem, rather than let's become isolationists 
and, and, and not participate in the world because that doesn't go well for us. I think that's the real root of the problem. Mm -hmm. I would say AUKUS has brought up the issue in Australia because there's going to be a lot of money required from Australian taxpayers. And I think last week, 60 Minutes Australia did a piece where they actually wrote a Virginia class submarine. It was pretty cool. And of course, the audience is the Australians. And, um, you know, I, I, it, it's interesting to me that they're doing a pretty good job with a full court press on the Australian public as to why they, they're going to need to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to bring the SSN capability to Australia. I think they're doing a better job than we are, frankly. I'll just say, I, I think everyone liked Top Gun Maverick. Uh, <laughs> so Naval Aviation's piece in it. Um, no, but to, to, to be a little more serious, um, you see the, the Red Sea engagements that are happening right now. Um, a simple thing that our, our public affairs folks could do in, in that scenario is talk about the ships that were defended and where they were from and what they were carrying and where they're going, right? Telling a story about what our Navy is doing right now, globally, is, is so important. You know, the, the, those merchant ships that were out there targeted, you know, they've, they've got a, uh, containers full of, uh, you know, this year's hot Christmas toy or, or whatever, right? And American people care about, about that kind of thing. Um, and so if we can tell that story about how the Kearney um, shooting off a couple of missiles and making the rest of the surface force jealous, how that enables prosperity at home. Like, I think that's a story we really can tell, but I, I also think it's a story that we've um, sort of uh, struggled to tell um, from a sort of public affairs, public engagement standpoint. At, at the start of this project, the American Sea Power Project in, in March, uh, February, March, 2021, two great articles that I, Ensign Hamlet wishes he had been able to read. Uh, one is Jim Holmes, who's a professor at the Naval War College, brilliant guy who takes complicated issues and presents them very, uh, you know, in a way that's understandable for Ensign Hamlet. Uh, but his article was, was titled, Great Responsibility Demands a Great Navy. And it, you know, to Admiral Winnefeld's point, the United States has signed up for global leadership over the last 100 years or so. Uh, and that, that doesn't just, you know, come because we want to lead the world. It, it takes conscious decisions to build a military to build naval capability. The other one is Nick Lambert's, I mentioned it earlier, what is a Navy for? And that really gets back to first principles. Mahanian, yes, but not Mahanian in battle force on battle force, but Mahan's concept about uh, arranging and protecting and deranging global trade as a major part of the, uh, the, the reason, the raison d'etre for a Navy. So I would I just uh, highlight those two amazing articles from three years ago, almost three years ago. Uh, over here. Uh, morning, gentlemen. Ensign Jens Sorensen. So within all the discussion of the industrial base and expanding the industrial base, is there a need, as we're trying to project what is needed in the future, to account for attrition in the industrial base in that if I'm an up-and-coming power in a shooting war with the United States and I know that historically shipbuilding has been a weakness, I might see fit to think, well, if I can take out one of their shipyards, then that hurts them even more, right? So are we confident we can protect what shipbuilding infrastructure we have and what we will build, or do we need to account for the fact that after a certain point, we might lose shipyards uh, as the enemy prosecutes us? Well, as a former NORTHCOM commander, I can tell you that, that we are not very well positioned to defend this country from cruise missile attacks you know, and the like. Um, the, only, the, the one thing that is, is interesting in this whole scenario is um, nuclear armed powers are very reluctant to attack each other directly, uh, which is why I think we will be very, direct, uh, uh, very reluctant to attack the Chinese mainland, uh, which is, uh, by the way, could be a key assumption that the U.S. military is relying on. I uh, don't know. Um, so I, so I think it would be unlikely that they would do it, but that doesn't mean they won't. Uh, and we are not well positioned to protect that, but it would be an interesting target for them to take on. Paul. 20 years ago or more, two Chinese colonels wrote uh, uh, basically a book called Unrestricted Warfare, uh, which gets around the problem, mm -hmm. the conundrum that the Admiral just mentioned. And so if you read that book, you would you would come away convinced that in direct and indirect ways, the Chinese are absolutely planning to do what you said. 
So this is, this is one of the aspects of the return to great power competition that must be faced. We must, we're being confronted with these realities and whether we uh, respond to them or not will depend upon whether we, be, we stay a great power or not. And by the way, it'll probably be a cyber attack anyway, a devastating cyber attack. <laughs> Denise. Hi, my name is Denise, and I'm a former Maritime Administration Chief Counsel. Uh, I have a logistics question for you. So 12 years ago, when I was Maritime Chief Counsel, I was looking at a decrepit maritime fleet. I mean, let's be honest, if the surge fleet could leave the pier, we were lucky. If the closer civilians... To, closer to the mic. Closer okay, to the mic. let's be honest. Mm -hmm. All right, so if the surge fleet could leave the pier, we were lucky, sometimes not. Uh, how old were the mariners? Pretty old, not getting younger. Uh, we had a shrinking international fleet. We had a shrinking industrial base. We had folks that didn't want to go out to sea. That was 12 years ago. Now I'm looking at 2023, and things haven't improved. <coughs> so how do we go to war in China with logistically if we are less than 100 international blue water fleet, if our crew is now probably aging around 50, if we do have to call up the reserves, those are the folks that are supposed to be manning the civilian fleet. If the civilian fleet, by the way, can't get out because the ship is broken, what do we do? How do we get there? Is the question directed at MSC? Well, it could be MSC, it could be a big Navy, but it's got to be addressed to DOD because if the civilian fleet is broken, we don't go to war. Yeah, I think it's more of a Europe problem than a uh, China problem. I don't see us putting ground forces in China, but there are certainly elements of Mara, Mara that would carry things that are not ground forces, but it's, it is very ground force heavy. Uh, and so I, I do worry about this uh, on the uh, European side uh, if we have a crisis there. I, I, my personal opinion is we should have much more prepo in Europe because it's going to take too long to get the stuff there even on Mara, and it, if it even s survives the trip, um, uh, which, is, which is another problem. So. Uh, it, that's a big topic. I'd turn to mm -hmm. other folks on the panel. I'd also, uh, previews of coming attractions in the either January online or February issue of the magazine will be an article by Sal Mercagliano looking at logistics and looking at some of the, you know, the Ready Reserve Fleet and the Marad, et cetera, MSC. Um, so, yeah, it, this, this, can, this debate and discussion will continue, and you bring up a very good point that we want people to be thinking about and writing about for us. I do want to comment on the what would Henry Kaiser do, though, point. <laughs> you know, he, he was the right man for the time, and he pumped out a bunch of ships during World War II, thousand ships, right? And, and we would need something like that today, but it has to be pointed out that the those ships were easy to sink, and the crews considered them death traps. And so, you know, there was a downside to that, particularly when it came to the escort carriers. So there, there's, you know, Ron was right. There's a lesson to be learned from that on standardized hull forms that we could build, you know, the Swiss Ar Army knife into almost anything. But I would do it differently than Henry Kaiser did if we were to have to do that again. Bill, could I just address the requirements issue? Yeah, I think there are basically two requirements in what you're talking about. One is surface-borne logistics to the fleet. The other, however, is surface logistics support to the operation. The operation in the scenario, if you read the scenario, is bigger than just the fleet. Uh, the scenario alludes to, doesn't go into detail, uh, alludes to large-scale land maneuver warfare in the approaches to China, so the maritime approaches to China. So this is a two, two-fold issue. Uh, from the beginning, from the outset of the project, in the scenario and now in the articles, we have, we have flagged the logistics issue as, as it's necessary to do exactly what Bill said, We'd get everybody thinking about this talking about it and solving the problem. Over here. So uh, Don Klein from Theorem Han, I'm going to come at you with another logistics uh, question coming from P3 guy. I know it's painful, but, you know, we talked a lot about production on the front end of ships, aircraft, munitions, but eventually 
we're going to go Winchester, whether it's a DDG or an aircraft. And in comparison to 30 or 40 years ago, we have a, a very minimal tender capability. But if you look, take the example of what's documented in Neptune's Inferno, a lot of the rearming, a lot of the repair was done forward. And we're taking very, very, I don't, I don't even want to call them baby steps, we're crawling towards experimentation. But, but as I mentioned earlier, time is of the essence, and I'm not sure if we can get there from here to have a credible battle damage repair to include taking care of our personnel that are wounded up forward as well. So I'd like to hear your perspectives on maybe how we can kind of uh, accelerate that to, because we're gonna have to fight with what we have. You know, recognize that we have production limitations. Thanks. Uh, I, 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 I talked a little bit about some of this in, in my article in that um, repairing airplanes is uh, very complicated, which probably doesn't sound all that surprising. Um, but unlike the old days when airplanes were made out of uh, sheet metal and you could rivet a, a panel into it and send it flying again, our airplanes now are made out of this um, carbon composite. It's very um, complex. Um, it's very lightweight. It's uh, very flexible, but it's also very hard to repair. We, we not only need a way to repair battle-damaged airframes while at sea, we need a way to get the parts that are gonna be needed to repair those airframes at sea, at sea, right? We, we need to get those there. And, and you talk about repairing forward. One of the problems with this scenario is forward is a lot further back than it used to be. Um, and we, we, need to, we need to think about that. The, the, the fuel uh, tank crisis in Hawaii, um, that needs to be an alarm bell for all of us because um, that may be as far forward as we can reliably get for a, for a while. Um, I, I think we have to explore um, uh, ways to, to rearm and repair at sea, including um, VLS uh, reloading at sea, which I, I saw a headline about um, just the other day, and unfortunately I didn't have time to, to dig into it, but hopefully that's a capability that's coming, um, because we, we may find ourselves Winchester very quickly. I used the example of the strikes against Syria um, a few years back, um, which were 56 cruise missiles against an undefended sort of soft target. Um, and uh, 56 cruise missiles is, is probably going to Winchester a, a, D, a DDG of TLAMs in one shot. Um, now you have to double it because those targets are hardened targets. Um, and then you maybe have to triple it because those targets are also defended. So you need a huge salvo size that's going to wipe your TLAM inventory very quickly. Um, so rearming ships at sea and building the magazine depth to take those armaments forward is uh, is vital, but it's a it's a problem that requires more of everything. So I'm not sure if that's a satisfactory answer. We're going to keep the questions going. I do yeah. uh, recognize that Admiral Will Winifeld has to leave us, but we we, we will keep this going yeah. for another few minutes My while we wait for the next speakers. Great questions, everybody. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Thanks for being here today. Uh, over here, Moon Pitch. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Boon Pitt, again, um, I am from USNI proceeding. Uh, my question is, China built a naval base in Cambodia plus an airport nearby. And from your perspective, gentlemen, what should be the best response from the US Navy or the US government to deal with this? Thank you. Well, it's not the only one they've built, right? I mean, there's one on the Horn of Africa. They're, they're, they're trying to get into Central America. Um, the, you know, we've left a power vacuum around the world, disengagement, and it's not going to get better if we continue to expand the isolationist policies or tendencies that we're seeing come out of, uh, out of um, congressional representatives and, and others in the country. Um, power fields a vacuum. I mean, it just happens. It's, it's really hard to pull that back once it happens. I wish I had a more cogent, uh, enlightened answer for you, but the real answer is to stay engaged in places that this kind of thing could happen to before it happens, because once it happens, it's really hard to put that genie back in the bottle. I'd also point out, and this is not my opinion, but some, something that uh, proceedings authors have said in a series of articles the last couple of years, pointing out that uh, China's spending a lot of money around the world, 
but afterwards, you know, a lot of those countries that accept that infrastructure investment from China find that it was not such a great deal for them. And so the United States perhaps isn't spending on that spending spree like the Chinese have been, but we tend to be better long-term partners. And highlighting that is very important strategically. So if you look at uh, the debt trap that, uh, that Sri Lanka is in with the port of Hambantota, for example, uh, so that China comes in, offers low interest loans, uh, they bring their own workers in to build that, and then afterwards they say to the Sri Lankans, uh, now you owe us this much money uh, per month every year for the next 100 years. It, it becomes very expensive, and those countries find themselves with infrastructure that perhaps they didn't need, and certainly with debt that is now a huge problem for them. And highlighting that uh, is a key part of the information space. Uh, it, that's just my two thoughts, but it also comes from you know, a number of proceedings authors have pointed that out. Over here, sir. Hi, Blake Hall here. I'm a current student at one of the universities in the area. Uh, my question to you is, what is the likelihood or thoughts on pulling ships or aircraft out of retirement due to the complications of deploying new ships? Ghost fleet. Uh, pulling them out of where? I'm sorry. Out of mothballs. Out of mothballs. Yeah. Not an option for submarines. I don't, I don't think it's much of an option for aviation either. He, you know, Admiral Winnefeld, as much as Admiral Winnefeld probably loved to jump back in the cockpit of, a, um, of an F-14, uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the effort to, to go through something like that is, is, um, is not reliable or sustainable. The Air Force may, with enough inventory and, and similar type model series, they may have a different answer for you, but I, I don't think naval aviation is equipped to do something like that. Well, it depends. If you're talking about short term or long, slightly, somewhat longer term, one of the things that uh, the, the surface domain authors brought up was it's not the platform, it's the munitions, right? And so in that context, as difficult as it would be to bring back ships that have been laid up for any amount of time, let alone a long period of time, and as difficult as it would be to man them, which is, of course, another issue, then the issue becomes, would you, why would you be doing that in the first place? And perhaps there's something to this idea of platforms versus munitions. Right now, the Navy has a philosophy of exquisite platforms, but very few of them, and terrific but shorter range munitions. And the authors of the surface domain article are suggesting different approaches, one of which might be bringing ships out of the mothball fleet and putting advanced munitions on their flight decks and, and fantails. Thank you. Okay. Over here. He hello, uh, Greg Lewis, uh, Association of Marine Corps Logisticians. Um, thank you, this is a, a great presentation. I think it's largely focused on great power conflict that's coming up. Uh, I'd, I'd like to, my question is kind of getting at great power competition. There's a community that is not represented on this panel, that's the logistics community, and as a logistician, um, I think that one of my questions would be why is there not a logistician here? Not, not in an administrative sense, uh, but I think we've got a, a, the logistics community, and, and Graham, you actually helped me write an article for another organization, um, SIMSEC, actually, but, uh, which was focused on transportation command, military security command, the fight to get to the fight. Uh, we've, our, our logisticians are, are forward, uh, so when you know, they go ahead, just like in the Napoleonic era where they went ahead of the force and they're there, you've got a steady state force uh, of Naval Facilities Command, NAVSUP, Military Chief Command, and so forth. How can we look at using our logistics organizations as logisticians forward? Are there better ways that we can use them um, instead of just looking at it as a support element, as a, as a forward force? That's well, a, well that's these a, guys think. Let that, me, let me uh, just make a point about the, the winning article or the winning essay in our Marine Corps essay contest, which was published in the November issue, was about logistics and about making uh, Force Design 2030 logistically sustainable. And it's a terrific article, so I, I would recommend that one to you. I can't remember the exact title of the article. Put 3MEF uh, in the fighting stance. Yeah, well, no, no, 3MEF in the fighting stance is in the December issue. <clears throat> and that's part of this American Sea Power Project. But the winner of the, of the Marine Corps essay contest 
uh, was an article about uh, making Force Design 2030 logistically viable. It's a great article. I'll, I'll see me afterwards and I'll point you to the exact article, but uh, I, I would point that out. For, th for this panel, we brought representatives of the five, excuse me, five articles that we published this month. And as I said, logistics will be coming in January or February, so if we have a, another panel coming, maybe we bring that one up. Good point. So let me give you at least a short answer. The implications of great power competition, peer competition, and war is that you step up to fill the vacuum that exists with regard to logistics. No one here could possibly think that we have the logistical capacity or sustainability for anything close to what we're looking at, but is there a Davidson window or isn't there? So this is part of this process of reorienting the American political mindset with regard to what is coming. <clears throat> now, there's no, we're not, we're not predicting that it's gonna happen that way, but that's what's on the table. And we'll get to logistics later, as Bill said, because the articles have been written and they're just not in the issue yet. Bill Guerrier. Sure. Bob Guerrier, uh, Cypress International and proud Naval student member. Uh, so in your scenario, did you, did you think about the China-Taiwan, U.S.-China conflict as round one? Um, what happens on the other side? Who rebuilds first? Who rebuilds faster? What do you rebuild? D did you think about that outcome as, as, as uh, up front and, and how it informs what we do now? Well, we, di we did definitely think about it. We're thinking about it all the time. The scenario alluded to the fact that this was basically, and I hate to do this because it's not meant to be a war game, but move one in a much longer lasting conflict, not to mention even longer lasting competition. Mm -hmm. So yes, but uh, we, we offer no conclusions. Yeah, it, it, to, to Paul's point, you know, it, it was not a war game. Uh, it's also not meant to be a prediction, but it was meant to take, you know, we're, we've been funneling from the ends of strategy to the ways of strategy to the means, and we thought the best way to address to look at the means was through the lens of this Davidson window, the 20, you know, the decade of maximum danger which we're in, and then ask people who are experts in certain warfare areas in, in the Navy and the Marine Corps to say, okay, you know, how would this go in 2026? Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, we'll see what comes next from uh, uh, other authors as they react to this. What I was trying to get at is, is, is that in many of you that this problem never goes away. It really is round one. And, and, and that reality, if you agree with that point, really informs what we should be doing right now, as urgent as it is, because right. whatever happens, whatever the outcome is, there's gonna be a lot of more work to be done. Another way to think about this is that many people now are saying, and uh, others are protesting, that this is a new Cold War, right? And that's the implications of that are exactly what you're getting at. I would say, though, that assuming the invasion is stopped, which is the way you get to the end of round one, Admiral, um, we would, I think, initially be in a better position than they would. But that won't last for long. They will turn on that crank. They could way out produce us. And this is hard, cold, hard reality, right? And it may, it may end up worse after that than it is now. So that's something to really, it's a great question. It's something to really think hard about. Graham? Yeah, I, I, all I was gonna say is that um, the list of people who have been wrong about a short, sharp war deciding the fate of whatever um, is, uh, is pretty long. Yeah. I, and I think we have to be ready for this, uh, you know, the scenario that we're presented is, is very opening round, very um, um, early days. Um, but it would be foolish to think that that opening round, those early days, would, would once and for all settle it. We, and I worry that we've spent a lot of our, um, our, our time and effort um, chasing after weapons or platforms or capabilities that are designed to be the one thing that's going to keep this war nice and short and tidy and put it in a box. And, and I don't think history 
um, backs us up on that. We have to be ready for um, a long conflict um, that needs to be sustainable. And we, we see that in uh, Ukraine, for example, right now um, as just one example. Yes, sir. Over here. Uh, thank you for an outstanding and enlightening presentation, gentlemen. In terms of alliances, et cetera, should we be looking at the fact or the possibility of other nations, specifically North Korea or Iran, opportunistically piggybacking on a U.S.-China conflict over Taiwan? Uh, as one of the co-authors of the scenario, uh, that was one of the things that when we were trying to scope the scenario, we thought about. And there is reference in the scenario to uh, tensions on the, on the Korean Peninsula uh, and the need to attend to and deter what North Korea could do. Uh, it also mentions that it would be in China's strategic interest uh, to encourage Russia to continue its misbehavior on the European continent and the other side of the world, right? Uh, and uh, to, to uh, operating through proxies, including the Iranians. And you know, to me, the, what's happening with Iran and the Houthis and yes. you know, firing weapons out over the Red Sea that are causing us to shoot, you know, the US Navy these days to shoot a lot of very expensive weapons. I, I think that's illustrative of the, the, you know, the, the multi, uh, lateral, multi-regional part of this problem. So we, we thought about that. It's hinted at in the scenario, but because of you know word space in the magazine and that sort of thing, we didn't go <clears throat> World War III, right? But we sort of started with this China-Taiwan with some hints at what would that do in other parts of the world. Yeah, Bill, if I could spin off of that. The indications are, of course, that Hamas, that Iran had coordinated Hamas and Hezbollah Everybody is supposed to attack together. It looks like Hamas got ahead of the game and kind of you know, snapped the ball earlier than they were supposed to. So the question becomes less of would North Korea take advantage and more would China coordinate an attack on Taiwan with North Korea so that South Korea is tied up by North Korea and can't get involved in supporting us, and you know, they, they've got great submarines that would be taken out of the fight, a whole bunch of things like that. I think that's a very worrisome, uh, whether it's likely or not, um, because I don't think they trust the North Koreans any more than we do. That's another conversation. There's a, there's a, a slightly different way to look at this, which is that now moving away from the scenario, in the real world, uh, the, the challenge is becoming transcontinental, Eurasian, rather than just Western Pacific. Uh, the rise of uh, from east to west, China, Iran, uh, and Russia, who, in my view, but I can't prove it, are colluding, at least. Um, this, this, puts, this puts the US Navy in a very different light that it's dealing with the periphery of Eurasia, that it's a global, that it's forward. Uh, that's not, I don't think, what the Navy's been thinking of itself for some time. So this is, this is just food for thought. We have time for one more question. Thank you, gentlemen. Morning, gentlemen. Uh, my name is Andres Obrada. I'm an intern for Senator Marco Rubio. I was wondering, so as seen in the war in Ukraine, Ukrainian Navy has utilized unmanned vessels in the Black Sea to attack Russian ships and render them inoperable. Should the US Navy place an emphasis on the use of drones against the Chinese fleet, and what would that look like? The, the quick answer is, should we? Yes. <laughs> yes. Can we, by the time that this scenario that we're discussing um, rolls into place? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm not a surface, um, uh, unmanned surface guy, but I don't think I don't think we're there, and I and I think that um, if you look at Ukraine, the 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 unmanned piece is only part of a much larger piece of the puzzle, and we've had a tendency to to pin our hopes to unmanned again as a as a war winner or as a game changer instead of instead of making it part of a larger approach um, that leverages both what we have and then what we can what we can bring uh, in the near term. Um, so, is there a role? Um, in this scenario, it will be very limited. In the future, I think it, I, 
I think they'll be very important, but we can't um, we can't look at it as a as a cure all. That's my two cents. Anyway. It's, a, it's a great question, and I and I saw it coming. Uh, but they're military technical and military operational kind of realities. The first is, in this scenario, um, the two sides have fought. The U.S. has been pushed back. And now, at range, we are looking at each other, shooting at each other, but at range, which means that we're out of range of the kinds of drones and unmanned, uncrewed vehicles that you might have in mind. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that with regard to range, the military technical development of these platforms is not where it would be to what you're getting at. On the other, but on the third hand, um, there are going to be long range loitering munitions. And so, but this is at least, it's kind of like, uh, well, it's, it's always five years out. Right? <laughs> but this has been seen for many, many years as those kinds of long-range lo loitering munitions, but they're not there yet. So in this, certainly in this scenario, not yet. That's what I would say. Thank you. I want to thank our panelists and also the audience for your questions, which were just terrific. Uh, Paul, Bill, and Graham, uh, thanks for writing for proceedings and for being here today. And as a small token of our appreciation, we have a copy of Brent, uh, Brent Sadler's book, U.S. Naval Power in the 21st Century by the Naval Institute Press. Gentlemen, thank you.